the greatest stories in history were told in Greek mythology. Bringing out gods and heroes, amazing feats. Listen and you'll see it's Greek Out. The list of heroes in Greek mythology has a lot of great names on it. Hercules, Odysseus, Perseus, Achilles. But the greatest name on that list may be Jason. Hey, there's a guy on my train named Jason. The name Jason was popular in the USA and the UK in the mid-1970s, but its popularity waned in the 80s. Jace, a shortened variant of Jason, has been among the 100 most popular boys' names in each of the last three years. Jason might be a popular name in today's world, but in ancient Greece, his voyages and adventures were anything but common. Things started out rough for Jason, right from the moment he was born. You see, Jason was the prince of a country called Iolcus, but his mean uncle Peleus had stolen the kingdom from Jason's father because he wanted to be king. Peleus sought advice from the Oracle of Delphi. Oracles were mysterious sacred spaces where the priestesses and priests could communicate with the gods. The most famous one was the Oracle at Delphi, where a priestess spouted prophecies in a trance. The Oracle told Peleus that he would be king of Iolcus, but he should, quote, beware the young man with one sandal, for he would someday take Peleus' throne. Jason's mother was so worried about what Peleus would do to her unborn son that she gave birth in secret and then sent him to live with a centaur, a half-horse, half-human creature. No, really. His name was Chiron, and apparently he was a pretty cool dad. He was great at piggyback rides. Once he grew up enough, Jason decided to reclaim his throne. He said goodbye to his half-horse dad and traveled all the way across Greece, at some point losing a sandal along the way, but eventually making it to Yilkes to challenge his uncle Peleus for the throne. So here's King Peleus sitting on his throne, watching some sort of sporting event that they were having that day, when all of a sudden this dude pops up with one shoe and is all, hey, I'm your long-lost nephew. I think you're sitting in my seat. And by the way, do you have like a sock or something? Clearly, Peleus remembered the oracle's warning. So when Jason claimed to be the rightful king, he came up with a cunning plan. Peleus told Jason that he'd give up the throne if Jason could bring him the golden fleece. Fleas are small insects that... No, 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 not, not fleas. I said fleece. Fleece also refers to a soft cloth that is used to make warm clothes. Polar fleece creates a comfortable layer of insulation by trapping air in the pockets between its fibers. This helps trap your natural body heat inside your clothes. A fleece is also another word for the warmest part of a sheep's wool. The golden fleece was the wool of an enchanted winged ram hanging in a faraway land called Colchis. The king of Colchis, King Aetes, kept the fleece draped over the branch of a giant tree, guarded by a huge dragon that never slept. Peleus figured that the quest for the golden fleece was so dangerous that his nephew would either give up or die trying. But being a hero, Jason felt differently, and he decided to embark upon one of the greatest adventures of all time. But first, he needed a ride. Jason had no idea how to build a boat, but he had friends in high places. He prayed to the goddess Athena for help. Athena was a goddess of many things, reason, intelligent activity, arts, and literature, and she was famous for her majestic gray eyes. She was also the patron of craftsmen and taught the Greeks how to cook and sew. Athena inspired a shipbuilder named Argos to create what would become his masterpiece, a magical ship with places for 50 rowers and their oars that Jason called the Argo after its builder. Then Jason put out the call for a crew. And what a crew it was. There were sons of gods and kings that came from all over Greece to join Jason. Fifty of the finest adventurers in all of Greece. Even the mighty Hercules signed on. Hello, I'm Hercules. The journey of Jason and his Argonauts is legendary. I mean literally legendary. On their way to find the island of Colchis, a journey to the edge of the known world, they got sidetracked several times and had lots of crazy adventures that we're just going to kind of fast forward through. 
Let's see, they got tricked by wood nymphs, <laughs> mistaken for pirates, yar me matey, even wound up in a boxing match with a king. And along the way, they lost a lot of their valuable crew members. Even the mighty Hercules left the voyage. I'm Hercules. Goodbye. But eventually, they got a break in their search for the Golden Fleece. Jason and his Argonauts wound up in the country of Thrace. Thrace is a region in southeast Europe that encompasses modern-day Bulgaria. Thracians guest-starred in many Greek myths. At that time, Thrace was ruled by a king named Phineas. Phineas and Ferb is an American animated musical no, 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 comedy no, no. show. I'm, I'm sorry, a d- different Phineas. You see, in addition to being a king, this Phineas was also pretty handy at telling fortunes. In fact, he was so good that the gods had punished him for it. First, they blinded him. Then, they sent these creatures called harpies to torment him. A harpy is a half-woman, half-bird creature that loves to persecute humans and is always hungry. So every evening at dinner, Phineas would find a great feast laid out for him. But as soon as he sat down to eat, the harpies would steal the food from him and leave behind such a stench that whatever food was left would be ruined. The average healthy person passes gas around 14 times a day. Most of it goes unnoticed. This may not be the case for harpies. Poor Phineas was hungry all the time, but he could never eat. Also, he had to breathe through his mouth a lot. Jason took pity on King Phineas and decided to set a trap for the harpies at the next dinner. As soon as Phineas sat down to eat, the food snatchers appeared. But two of Jason's strongest warriors jumped out and attacked them. The harpies were so surprised and scared that they flew away and never returned again. Phineas was so happy that he immediately held a great feast to honor his guests. And at this feast, he gave Jason two pieces of very important information. One, how to get to the island of Colchis where the Golden Fleece was being kept. And two, how to get past the rocky cliffs that smashed every single ship on their way to the island. The cliffs were really just two huge rocks called the Simplegades that guarded the Black Sea. They were enchanted by an ancient spell so they could crash into each other without warning, like massive jaws that ate entire ships. Unfortunately, the only way to get to Colchis was through those rocks. Following the advice of their friend Phineas, who had just eaten his first meal in like a century, Jason released a dove and had it fly in between the two cliffs. As expected, the rocks smashed together as fast as they could. But the dove was small and quick, and the rocks only caught a little bit of its tail feather. So the Argo went next. The Simplegades pulled back to make sure they got a really good smash this time, but the Argo was faster than it looked. The boat made it in between the rocks just in time. Only a small part of the boat's stern was caught. From that moment on, the enchantment was broken, and the two rocks remained fixed in place. Finally, Jason and the Argonauts landed on the island of Colchis, home of the Golden Fleece. Colchis is a real place. It is located on the opposite end of the Greek world, in what is now known as Russia. This is the coast of the Black Sea, near Sochi, where the Winter Olympics were held in 2014. Finally, Jason was pretty sure that he was at the end of his quest. Okay, there was that whole dragon thing, but after everything he'd been through already, he was pretty confident that he could handle it. Jason felt like he was nine episodes into a ten-episode binge watch, and all he had to do was check in with the king on the island and explain things to him. But first, a word from our sponsor. Really? Right now? We were just getting to the good part and the... Okay, whatever. Welcome to Mount Olympus Pet Center, where the podcast Greeking Out inspires Zeus the Hamster and his wild crew of critters to go on quests of mythical proportions. Join Poseidon the Pufferfish, Demeter the Grasshopper, Athena the Cat, and Ares the Pug as they pursue epic adventures in the name of the gods. Zeus the Mighty, The Quest for the Golden Fleas, is the first book in a new Nat Geo Kids fiction series for middle grade readers, available wherever books are sold. Discover more at ZeusTheMighty.com. So, all Jason had to do was convince the king to give him the golden fleece. But, yeah, well, that didn't work out so good. 
On the plus side, King Aetes of Colchis had a beautiful daughter named Medea who seemed to hit it off with Jason, and she knew a little magic, which was pretty cool. In the minus column was the fact that Aetes had no intention of giving up the Golden Fleece. He knew Jason and the Argonauts were skilled warriors, so he didn't just try to attack them. Instead, he made a deal. King Aeti said that he would give Jason the Golden Fleece if Jason could plow a field with two wild magical bulls. Great. Another heroic deed. What is it with these kings and their heroic deeds? Oh, and did I mention the bulls breathe fire? And that instead of planting regular seeds when he plowed the field, Jason was planting dragon teeth? Poor Jason had no clue where to begin. But Medea did. She had fallen in love with this handsome stranger and decided to help him on his quest. So Medea gave Jason some ointment and a bag of rocks. It doesn't sound like much, I know, but Medea had a plan. The ointment protected Jason from fire, so he rubbed it all over himself. Since they couldn't burn him, Jason was able to corral the bulls, put them in a yoke, and plow the field. A yolk is sometimes considered to be the best part of the egg. No, 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 no. wrong yolk. A yolk is a wooden cross piece that gets fastened over the necks of two animals. It is then attached to the plow or cart that they are to pull. But of course, Jason was dropping dragon teeth into the soil, not seeds. And instead of growing tomatoes or rutabagas, dragon teeth grow human soldiers. And apparently, they grow really, really, really fast because suddenly the field was full of men in armor who had sprung out of the ground ready to attack something. Following Medea's advice, Jason started to throw rocks in the middle of the crowd of soldiers. Now, this didn't hurt them, probably didn't even make a dent in their armor, but it made them turn on each other, each thinking the next guy over had struck him. Instead of attacking Jason, as King Aetes had hoped, the soldiers attacked each other. So that leaves the dragon. The Golden Fleece was kept in the branches of an ancient oak tree, which was guarded by a giant dragon named Kolkiko. Once again, Medea saved Jason. She brewed another potion, but this time, instead of making Jason fireproof, the ointment made Jason entirely unappetizing to Kolkiko. Now, I'm no expert, but from what I understand, dragons were pretty much hungry 24-7, 365, so if Kolkiko took a pass on a fresh Greek hero sandwich, I'm guessing Jason must have been pretty stinky. A hero is a Greek dish made from meat cooked on a vertical rotisserie. It is usually served as a wrap or stuffed in a flatbread or pita. It is not related to the classic American submarine sandwich, sometimes called a hero, although both go great with fries. Regardless, the potion worked and Jason and Medea snatched the fleece and rushed back to the Argo for the long journey home. As you might expect, the trip back to Yolkis wasn't easy either. First, the Argonauts had to sail past the Island of the Sirens. No one had ever seen the Sirens and lived to tell about it. Some people said they were beautiful mermaids with cruel appetites. Others believed they were also bird creatures with the faces of beautiful women. But all of the legends said that their hypnotic singing voices would cast a spell on sailors, luring them towards the beautiful music and causing them to crash their ships on the rocks around the islands. But Jason had a secret weapon on board the Argo. His name was Orpheus, and he was a really good musician. The legend said he could play his harp, which is also called a lyre, as well as the god Apollo. Orpheus was indeed a legendary musician. It was said that his music could charm wild animals and make rivers stand still. So Jason ordered Orpheus to play as loudly as he could to drown out the sirens while the Argo sailed past the islands. Now I think a lyre kind of sounds like this. But for our purposes, you should probably imagine something more like this. Yeah. Orpheus shredded it, and the songs of the sirens did not pull the Argonauts off course. Then, the Argo had to sail through the Straits of Messina, guarded on one side by Charybdis, the whirlpool monster, and on the other by Scylla, a six-headed sea creature who lurked among the rocks and waves. The famous expression, 
between a rock and a hard place originated from sailors who navigated Charybdis's whirlpool and Scylla's rocks. This was the most dangerous passage in the sea at that time. A little too far to one side and you're sucked into a whirlpool. Too far to the other and a sea monster eats your ship. It was slow going, one stroke at a time. But very carefully, Jason and the Argonauts made it through and returned home to claim the throne of Ilkus. Jason took his kingdom back from his power-hungry uncle, and Medea, princess of Colchis, became Jason's queen. Greeking out. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Greeking Out. Stay tuned for next week's episode about Phaedon and the Sun Chariot. National Geographic Kids Greeking Out is written and hosted by Kenny Curtis, with Tori Kerr as the Oracle of Wi-Fi. Audio production and sound design by Scotty Beam. Jennifer Emmett is EVP of Kids Content at National Geographic, and Kate Hale edits Zeus the Mighty. Diane Klein is our fact checker, and Perry Grip composed our themes. Emily Everhart is our production manager. The stories featured in Greeking Out are original adaptations of classic Greek myths. This episode contains monsters, drinking, people getting eaten, and someone getting blinded. If that's not for you, maybe skip this one. Greeking out the greatest stories in history were told in Greek mythology. Greeking out gods and heroes, amazing feats. Listen and you'll see it's Greeking out. Monsters. They're everywhere. Turn on the TV, open up a comic book, click on a video on your tablet, and bam, before you can say boo, there's some scary clown or freaky zombie jumping out at you. Sometimes that's fun. Other times, not so much. But it just wouldn't be nearly as exciting if it wasn't for the monster. I mean, imagine if that zombie vampire thing in that one movie was actually just a little kid. It wouldn't be the same thing. The wasp Dinocampus coccinellae can lay their eggs in a living ladybug, basically making the ladybug into a zombie that will incubate and protect the growing wasp larva. Okay, that's gross. But before there was King Kong or Frankenstein, there were the monsters of Greek mythology. And each one of them has a story too good not to share around this time of year. Yes, these monsters can be pretty scary, especially if you have to fight them. But you got to admit, sometimes they're kind of cool, too. Let's start with the Sphinx. The Sphinx was a giant monster with the body of a lion, the head of a woman, wings of an eagle, and, depending upon who you ask, a snake for a tail. Sphinxes were originally Egyptian monsters. There's a famous statue of a reclining Sphinx who's missing a nose right next to the Great Pyramids of Giza. Greek and Egyptian cultures had tight links and influenced each other all the time. When Greeks learned about the Egyptian Sphinx, it started appearing in all sorts of Greek myths. The Sphinx was sent by the gods to plague the Greek town of Thebes as a curse for some crime. Cities in ancient Greece were always being cursed for one thing or another, and her favorite activity seemed to be tormenting travelers who were coming and going from the town. She would pounce upon her unsuspecting victims and force them to solve this riddle she was obsessed with before she would let them pass. Or not. Her riddle was famous. Which creature has only one voice, but four feet in the morning, two feet in the afternoon, and three feet at night? I certainly have no idea, but it sort of sounds like a creature from Greek mythology, doesn't it? And neither did most of the people who were unlucky enough to encounter her. Anyone who didn't answer her riddle correctly was devoured by the Sphinx. Despite dating back to 470 B.C., The riddle of the Sphinx is not the oldest recorded riddle. The oldest riddle is actually from the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus and can be dated back to 1650 BC. Despite popular opinion, the oldest riddle is also not Why did the chicken cross the road? Creon, the king of Thebes, was so upset by the Sphinx that he offered the actual throne of his kingdom to anyone who could outwit her. And when I say throne, I don't mean a fancy chair. I'm talking about the whole kingdom. Beat the Sphinx, you get to be king. That was the deal. Enter the hero. There was a brave fellow named Oedipus who was just walking to Thebes from Delphi and had gotten into a little traffic accident on the way. 
Oedipus heard about the king's offer and decided to give it a shot. So he sought out the Sphinx to challenge her. It wasn't long before he found her, of course. And she leapt upon him, pinning him to the ground and snarling her riddle in his face. Which creature has only one voice, but has four feet in the morning, two feet in the afternoon, and three feet at night? Now, Oedipus was a pretty clever guy, and he thought carefully about the riddle and about what the question really meant. After a while, he had the answer. A person, he said. People crawl on all fours as babies, walk on two legs as adults, and need a walking cane when they're old. The Sphinx roared her displeasure. No one had ever solved the riddle before. The average human walking speed is about 3.1 miles per hour. The average person takes around 7,500 steps per day and walks about 110,000 miles during their lifespan, if they live to be 80 years old. But instead of letting him go as she had promised, the Sphinx asked Oedipus a second riddle. That is cheating. Yeah, it kind of is. But I guess when you have the claws of a lion and a snake for a tail, you get to make the rules up as you go. Fair point. The Sphinx snarled, There are two sisters. One gives birth to the other, who in turn gives birth to the first. Who are they? Now, I have no idea how he figured this out or how long it really took, but I always imagined the Sphinx letting Oedipus get up so he could walk around and pace and scratch his chin and stuff and go, hmm. Eventually, Oedipus offered an answer. Night and day. Which totally makes sense. Night becomes day and day becomes night and so on and so on. The Sphinx was so angered that she had been bested twice that she flew into a rage and destroyed herself. Some legends say that she threw herself off a cliff. Others say she devoured herself, but either way, the riddle of the Sphinx had been solved. Now, where did that king get to? There is still the mystery of what happened to the nose on the Great Sphinx statue in Egypt. There is a legend saying that a cannonball fired by Napoleon soldiers hit the nose and caused it to break off. But historians have found sketches of a noseless sphinx published well before the era of Napoleon. An Egyptian Arab historian wrote in the 15th century that the nose was actually destroyed by a Sufi Muslim named Muhammad Saim al-Dar because he was outraged that Egyptian peasants made offerings to the Great Sphinx in the hope of controlling the flood cycle and the harvest. But we don't really know if this story is true, and the missing nose is still a mystery. Next, we'd like to introduce you to the Cyclopses. The Cyclops. The Cyclop. To Cyclopses. Ops means I, and cycle is circular. By themselves, a single creature would be a Cyclops, but two or more are called cyclopes. Ah, okay, thanks. Cyclopes. But first, a word from our sponsor. A comer- uh, n- uh, but I was right in the middle of the... Uh, all right. Welcome to Mount Olympus Pet Center, where the podcast Greeking Out inspires Zeus the hamster and his wild crew of critters to go on quests of mythical proportions. Join Poseidon the pufferfish, Demeter the grasshopper, Athena the cat, and Ares the pug as they pursue epic adventures in the name of the gods. Zeus the Mighty, The Quest for the Golden Fleas, is the first book in a new Nat Geo kids fiction series for middle grade readers, available wherever books are sold. Discover more at ZeusTheMighty.com. The Cyclopes were really big giants whose most noticeable feature was the fact that they only had one eye. The legends say that the Cyclopes were born from Gaia, the Earth, their mother, and Uranus, their father, who ruled the skies. They were so strong and ferocious that they were immediately locked away by Uranus, who was the current ruler of the universe. Eventually, Uranus was overthrown by Cronus, who became the new ruler of the Greek gods. But even still, the Cyclopes were kept locked away in the pits of Tartarus. In Greek mythology, Cronus was the leader and youngest of the first generation of Titans. They were the descendants of Uranus, the sky, and Gaia, the earth. It wasn't until the gods of Olympus took power that the Cyclopes were freed. The mighty Zeus himself let them go in exchange for having them make thunderbolts for him to hurl at his enemies. 
The most famous Cyclops story refers to a Cyclops named Polyphemus, who Poseidon loved and treated like a son. This story is probably from a book called The Odyssey. It's actually a really long poem written by a famous Greek storyteller called Homer, and it's all about this really smart guy named Odysseus and his ridiculously long journey home from the Trojan War. The ancient Greeks claimed that the Trojan War was a historical event of the 13th or 12th century BC, but many scholars believe that to be mostly a myth. There is, however, a real ancient city of Troy, located on the northwest coast of Turkey, which has been identified by experts as the same Troy discussed in the legend. So after a nasty storm blew them off course, clever Odysseus and his shipmates wound up sailing by a small wooded island where they decided to stop and scrounge up some food, water, and provisions for the journey ahead. They were literally starving. While looking around, they found a huge sheep pen outside of a cave, and inside the cave, a whole bunch of food. There was meat, there was cheese, there was a lot more. They didn't even think about it. They just started eating and eating and eating and were happy and full for the first time in a very long time. It takes the human body two days to fully digest a meal. Your stomach can hold about four cups of chewed up food. But they weren't happy for long. What the sailors didn't know was that the island was the home of a group of cyclopes, and they were intruding in Polyphemus's cave. So when he returned with his herd of sheep, rolling a rock in front of the cave entrance to keep his sheep inside, Polyphemus discovered a bunch of sleepy men laying around in what was left of his food. Now, you'd think he would be angry, but he was actually pleased. There's nothing a cyclops likes better than a sailor snack. Polyphemus promptly snatched up the nearest two of Odysseus' men and ate them whole. Now it became apparent to Odysseus and his men that they were in really big trouble. The stone over the mouth of the cave meant they couldn't leave, and they'd just eaten all of the Cyclops' other food. Polyphemus was not worried about some tiny humans. He belched loudly, <sighs> yawned, and then decided to take a nap content with the notion that he would have a nice supper waiting for him when he awoke. After a big meal, the body streams more blood to the digestive system to help with digestion. This means less blood and nutrients go to the brain, so you get sleepy. Eating more frequent, smaller meals can help preserve energy so you don't feel drowsy after eating. Odysseus needed to do something. It was obvious that the Cyclops was going to devour his whole crew one by one if he didn't take action. So he came up with a plan. When Polyphemus awoke, Odysseus offered him some wine. Now, this was really strong wine, which he and his men had brought with them from their ship. The Cyclops had never drunk wine before, and, well, it went straight to his head. Before he passed out again, Polyphemus the Cyclops asked Odysseus his name, to which Odysseus replied, uh, nobody. Well, nobody. I like you, the Cyclops said. I'll do you a favor and eat you last. And then he fell asleep. Any grown-up can tell you that alcohol makes you sleepy, but wine can actually make you sleepier. Some experts say that when the grapes ferment, it creates more melatonin than other alcohol, and melatonin is a hormone in your body that helps you sleep. As soon as they were pretty sure the giant would not wake up, Odysseus and his men got to work. They carved a sharp point on the end of a giant pole, heated it in the fire, and then thrust it into Polyphemus's eye, blinding the Cyclops. Obviously, Polyphemus woke up. He screamed in agony and staggered around blindly, groping for any of the nasty humans who had done this to him. But the Greeks dodged him all night long. At one point, Polyphemus even yelled to his Cyclops friends for help. Help! Come quickly! He shouted. What's the matter? They called from the other side of the giant boulder. He blinded me! Roared Polyphemus. What? Who did this to you? Who did this? Nobody, said Polyphemus. Nobody has blinded me. Nobody? Well, then stop bothering us. 
and the other Cyclopes stomped away from the cave. In the morning, Polyphemus had to let his sheep out of the cave so they could graze, but he was worried that the Greeks would try to sneak out. So he planted himself in the entrance, and even though he couldn't see, he touched the back of every sheep to make sure he was only letting out sheep and not Greek sailors. But Odysseus was smart enough to know him and his men couldn't get past Polyphemus by themselves. So they hitchhiked. They went underneath the sheep, clinging to their wool, hanging below the bellies, and one by one, they escaped the cave. According to the American Sheep Association, wool has some unique properties that make it one of nature's most amazing fibers. It's also an incredibly flexible and durable fiber and is said to be comparatively stronger than steel. When Polyphemus realized the Greeks had escaped, he stumbled down to the beach where Odysseus and his men were rowing hard for their ship. He began hurling giant rocks randomly into the water, hoping he would get lucky and maybe hit the boat he heard rowing away. Odysseus was very proud of his cleverness, and he couldn't stand the idea that no one would know he had outsmarted Polyphemus. He had to say something. Just so you know... My name is really Odysseus, the Greek called across the water. But you have nobody to thank for your troubles. Nobody but yourself, that is. But um bum Eh? See what he did there? With a mighty curse, Polyphemus threw a boulder which almost swamped the ship. But the rowers sped up and they were in the clear. They left the blinded Cyclops raging uselessly on the shore as they rowed for safety. It may interest you to know that Polyphemus eventually does get his revenge. He was Poseidon's favorite, after all. But that's another story for another time. The last Greek beastie we'd like to introduce you to is a classic sea monster. One you may have heard about before in other myths. And one who had the good fortune to find a great location. The last Greek beastie we'd like to introduce you to is a classic sea monster. One you may have heard about before in other myths and one who had the good fortune to find a great location. Scylla was a sea monster who haunted the rocks of a narrow strait opposite the whirlpool of Charybdis. Ships who sailed too close to her rocks could lose six men to her ravenous darting heads, but the ships who sailed too close to Charybdis would lose the whole crew because the entire ship would be sucked down to the watery depths. So Scylla got a lot of business, but how did she get there? Was she always just a roaring monster? (laughs) Just like any creature, there's always a story behind the fangs and the claws and the six heads. The poet Homer described Scylla as having 12 dangling feet and six long necks with grisly heads lined with three rows of sharp teeth. In classical art, she is often seen as a fish-tailed sea goddess with many dog legs and paws coming from her waist. Many classical writers told stories of Scylla as a beautiful maiden who had caught the eye of the sea god named Glaucus. She liked to play with the nymphs by the sea, and over time, Glaucus developed a major crush on her. Glaucus wasn't sure that Scylla would return his love, so he decided to get some outside help. He appealed to the sea witch Circe for help. But that was a mistake. You see, Circe had a thing for Glaucus, and she was really jealous of Scylla's beauty and charm. So she told Glaucus that she would help, but helping was not what Circe really had in mind. She made a potion of magic herbs that Glaucus was supposed to pour into the water where Scylla swam. But instead of making Scylla fall in love with Glaucus, these magic herbs would change her into a horrible beast. Glaucus did as he was instructed. He sprinkled the herbs in the well where Scylla liked to take a dip now and then and waited for her to jump in. But Scylla didn't fully commit. Maybe the water was really cold that day, or maybe she had just gotten her hair the way she liked it, but whatever the reason, Scylla only waded into the water part of the way, just up to her waist. When suddenly immersed in cold water, the human body reacts involuntarily. This can cause blood vessels in your skin to close, making it harder for blood to flow around the body. Your heart then has to work harder, and your blood pressure increases. 
However, the body acclimates most quickly with full immersion instead of slowly wading in. Since she didn't go all the way under, she wasn't completely transformed into a monster. While the lower part of her body was changed into the tail of a sea serpent surrounded by dog legs, the top half of her body remained partly a woman with a few extra snakeheads. Instead of falling in love with Glaucus, Scylla felt betrayed and was filled with rage toward all mankind. And from then on, she waited by the rocks across from the whirlpool for her chance to take her revenge on unsuspecting sailors. As in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, our hero clever Odysseus had to sail between Scylla and Charybdis. And like so many before him, he chose to stay away from the whirlpool. He had been warned about Scylla from Circe herself, but decided not to say anything to his crew because, well, he was worried that they would be too paralyzed with fear to sail correctly. Sure enough, six of his bravest men were plucked off his ship by Scylla, and the rest of his crew knew how lucky they were to have escaped with their lives. So what became of this terrible monster? If even the clever Odysseus couldn't find a way to defeat her, who could? That honor would go to Hercules. But that's also another story for another day. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Greeking Out. Stay tuned for next week's episode about how you shouldn't help Zeus with his problems. National Geographic Kids Greeking Out is written and hosted by Kenny Curtis with Tori Kerr as the Oracle of Wi-Fi. Audio production and sound design by Scotty Beam. Jennifer Emmett is EVP of Kids Content at National Geographic. And Kate Hale edits Zeus the Mighty. Diane Klein is our fact checker and Perry Grip composed our themes. Emily Everhart is our production manager. This week's story features spinning, weaving, a lot of bragging, and some gods in disguise. Please pay close attention. Breaking out the greatest stories in history were told in Greek mythology. Breaking out gods and heroes, amazing feats. Listen and you'll see it's great. This is the story of Arachne the Weaver, and it is a story about a contest between a mortal and a god. It is a story about talent, pride, and respect. But it is also a story about fabric. Most of the clothes we wear today come from a store, or if you're me, your older brother. But most of us never see how these clothes are made. In ancient Greece, the fabrics for clothes and blankets and rugs were all made the same way, by weaving with a loom. A loom is a device used to weave cloth and tapestries. The user stretches out a set of threads on the rack of the loom and then weaves another set of threads over and under and back and forth. To really understand the story of Arachne, you need to get this. Take a look at what you're wearing. If it's the right kind of material and you look really closely, you may be able to see the tiny threads that are stitched together to make the cloth. Nowadays, that's all done by machine. But thousands of years ago, these threads were woven together by hand on a loom. And the people who did this important work were mostly women and known as weavers. As part of the Industrial Revolution, weaving switched from hand to machine work. John Kay invented the flying shuttle in 1733 and allowed the weaving of wider fabric made faster. The first factories for weaving were built in 1785. Arachne was a weaver, and she was good. In fact, she was famous for it. Throughout the country, far and wide, people knew of Arachne's skill at the loom. In fact, she was so good that people would come and actually just sit and watch her weave together the most beautiful fabrics. And Arachne loved doing it. A lot of the stories from Greek mythology are about heroes who were descended from gods. They were skilled and gifted because they were part Olympian. But this wasn't the case for Arachne. She was just a regular mortal who was exceptionally good at making stuff on a loom. And how did she get so good? Practice. She did it all the time. And she did it all the time because she loved doing it. It was fun to her. The more she would weave, the better she would get. And since she wove all the time, she got really good. In fact, she became the best. Practice is the act of rehearsing a behavior over and over or engaging in an activity again and again. 
for the purpose of improving or mastering it, as in the phrase, practice makes perfect. If one enjoys the activity being rehearsed, it can be quite pleasing. Arachne was all about the weaving. Day in and day out, she would make the most beautiful tapestries and blankets and clothes. In all the world, there was no weave so tight, no embroidery so detailed, no colors so bright. Everything she wove was breathtaking. She became so popular that crowds would gather to watch her weave. Even nymphs and dryads would leave the woods and fields to come and watch her work. One day, one of them said to her, Miss, your skills are so great, the goddess Athena must have taught you how to weave. It was meant as a compliment, but Arachne didn't see it that way. She didn't want anyone else taking credit for her skill, not even the gray-eyed Athena, the goddess who protected all crafting and household arts. It's like if somebody said to you, wow, you're so lucky you got a good grade. Was it luck, or did you work really hard for your grade? I did not learn from Athena, Arachne said in response. My talent is my own. I am the greatest weaver by my own hand and no one else's. At that, an old woman in the crowd spoke up. But surely your skill is allowed by the grace of the gods, my child. You are only a mortal. Arachne replied, Athena does not allow me to be good. I am good. I may even be better than the goddess herself. At this the woman began to transform. The old crone was suddenly gone, and in her place was a tall, elegant, and powerful-looking woman wearing a breastplate made of leather with gray eyes, dark hair, and a golden helmet. The old woman's walking cane was now a spear, and her tattered cloak had changed into a shining white dress. It was the goddess Athena herself. Athena is known as the Greek goddess of wisdom and war, but she was also a very important patron of many other things. She is goddess of wisdom, courage, inspiration, civilization, law and justice, strategic warfare, mathematics, strength, strategy, and the arts, crafts, and skills. What all these things have in common is creativity. The Greeks saw Athena as the goddess who could turn on your creativity so you saw a way to move forward. In battle, in creative projects, and more. She also had a thing for owls. I am Athena, goddess of craft and wisdom, she said. Your talent is great, Arachne. But are you sure you mean to say that you can weave as well as a god? Arachne paled at the sight of the goddess before her. The crowd began to shrink back, and a great hush fell upon them. Arachne gulped, took a deep breath, and then held her head high defiantly. Yes, she said. I believe I can weave as well as you or any god. The crowd gasped in shock. Who would dare challenge a god? This was a big no-no for the ancient Greeks. There was certain to be punishment, but Athena seemed to enjoy Arachne's response. Very well, she said. We will have a contest here tomorrow. You weaving on your loom and me on mine. All are welcome to watch, but only Zeus himself will judge whose work is best. The winner will have the glory. But the loser must promise never to touch a spindle or loom or a single thread again. Agreed? Never weave again? Ever? I mean, this was what Arachne loved the most in the world. Was she so sure of herself that she would risk losing it forever? Agreed, Arachne replied. Apparently she was. But first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, but I was just, did okay, we got to pay the bills. All right, fine. Welcome to Mount Olympus Pet Center, where the podcast Greeking Out inspires Zeus the hamster and his wild crew of critters to go on quests of mythical proportions. Join Poseidon the pufferfish, Demeter the grasshopper, Athena the cat, and Ares the pug as they pursue epic adventures in the name of the gods. Zeus the Mighty, The Quest for the Golden Fleas is the first book in a new Nat Geo Kids Fiction Series for middle grade readers. Available wherever books are sold. Discover more at ZeusTheMighty.com When the time came for the contest, a great crowd had gathered to witness the event. The mighty Zeus and the other gods of Olympus seated themselves among the clouds to watch the two weavers work and what work they did. 
Their hands flew back and forth across the looms, over and under and around, weaving the different color threads into the fabric until eventually shapes and images and pictures began to form. Athena was angry at Arachne for being so prideful, but she was also impressed with the mortal's courage and determination. She just wanted Arachne to learn a lesson in humility, so she spun her threads into a beautiful tapestry that seemed more like a painting. And this painting depicted scenes of Athena's triumphs and some of the gods' victories over the mortals who challenged them. The tapestry glowed like a piece of the sun and was as colorful as the rainbow. A tapestry is a piece of thick textile fabric with pictures or designs formed by weaving colored threads. A rainbow is a meteorological phenomenon caused by the dispersion of light in water droplets. This results in a spectrum of light appearing in the sky, taking the form of a multicolored circular arc. Rainbows that show up at night are called moonbows. But Arachne didn't get the hint. Or maybe she did and decided to ignore it. But either way, she made her loom sing a very different song. This is not meant literally. Looms don't sing. They don't do anything. They are inanimate objects that people use to weave. Arachne's tapestry told the story of the different ways the gods had mistreated mortals over the years. It was a rich and complex collage of scenes, so many examples of how humans were often punished by the gods without reason. And Arachne even went so far as to mock the gods, depicting Zeus and Apollo as silly animals. And yet, this tapestry was also glorious. There had never been anything like it woven before. It was sad and breathtaking, but also disrespectful toward the gods. And in the general opinion of the crowd, it was way better than Athena's tapestry. Such beauty, such amazing craftsmanship, truly a sight to behold. But remember, the crowd did not get to choose the winner. Zeus did. And this contest had yielded such spectacular results that he decided to come down from Olympus to see each weaving up close. Zeus watched over Athena as she wove with great pride. She was skilled and her quick fingers were creating a masterpiece. It seemed to glow and shine as if it was lit from within. But then he went to see what Arachne was up to and everything changed. At first, his jaw dropped. His eyes went wide as he tried to take in the amazing design before him. He had never seen anything so stunning. Arachne smiled to herself as she wove. This is... uh, This this is... uh... It was clear the king of the gods was overwhelmed. He was almost at a loss for words. This is so beautiful it belongs in Olympus. Such detail. These pictures are... And then he looked closely at one of the scenes where a donkey wearing a crown was hurling a thunderbolt at an unsuspecting human. And another where a pig descended from a cloud to steal a herd of cattle. And Zeus's mood began to change. He fixed his eyes on Arachne, but she wisely chose not to meet his gaze, instead keeping her head down to continue working even though she knew she was in danger. The winner is Athena, the mighty Zeus decreed to the crowd. And then turning back to Arachne, he said, And by rule, you shall never touch spindle or loom again. This, he said, pointing accusingly at Arachne's weaving, will be your last creation. And with that, Zeus vanished back to Olympus in a burst of thunder and lightning so strong that it scorched the ground and destroyed Arachne's beautiful tapestry, leaving it in flames. Sadly and quietly, the crowd began to file away, leaving only Athena, Arachne, and a pile of ashes. Forgive me, Athena, Arachne said through her tears. I I was too proud, and I was foolish. Must I really never weave again? I would forgive your debt if I could, Athena replied. But a bargain with the gods cannot be undone, even by me. You promised never to touch spindle or loom again, and so you must not. Arachne was devastated. If she couldn't weave, she didn't know what she would do with herself. But, said Athena, there is a way for you to weave and still hold to your bargain. And with that, she touched Arachne on the forehead with the spindle of her loom, 
A bright light filled the air, and much like the old woman the day before, Arachne began to change. But this time, she was changing into something much smaller. Metamorphosis is a word that refers to the change of the form or nature of a thing or person into a completely different one, using natural or supernatural means. In Arachne's place was a nimble, graceful spider standing where Arachne once stood. She immediately darted away into the tall grass and began to merrily weave a web. Since it is your joy to weave, said Athena, you and your children and your children's children shall weave forevermore. It only takes about one hour for the average spider to construct the elaborate web of silk thread called an orb web. The scientific class for spiders is arachnid, which comes from the name arachne. And to this day, we see the descendants of arachne all around us. Spiders weave their beautiful webs each day. They live in them, they lay eggs in them, and they use them to catch their prey. But a spider web isn't built to last forever. So all of the great, 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 great granddaughters of arachne are always joyfully weaving new webs. That's it for Season 1 of National Geographic Kids Freaking Out. We hope you and your family enjoy. National Geographic Kids Greeking Out is written and hosted by Kenny Curtis, with Tori Kerr as the Oracle of Wi-Fi, audio production and sound design by Scotty Beam, Jennifer Emmett is EVP of Kids Content at National Geographic, and Kate Hale edits Zeus the Mighty. Diane Klein is our fact checker, and Perry Grip composed our themes. Emily Everhart is our production manager. The stories featured in Greeking Out are original adaptations of classic Greek myths. This week's story features the love of a mother and daughter, a kidnapping, fruits that are actually berries, dial-up, and making decisions for yourself. Greeking Out, the greatest stories in history, were told in Greek mythology. Greeking Out, gods and heroes, amazing feats, listen and you'll see it's great. Today's story is centered around one of the most intense relationships in the human experience. It's sometimes heated, sometimes tense, and sometimes borderline smothering, but no matter what, it's always complicated. Today, we're talking about mother and daughter relationships, specifically the relationship between Demeter and Persephone. May I say something? Wow. Asking before you speak. That's new this season. Yes, of course, Oracle. What's up? I am aware that this may be slightly off-topic, but I would just like to say that I have a great relationship with my mother. That's nice to hear. I appreciate you sharing. She is an older model, referred to as dial-up, internet connection. Senior listeners may be familiar. Oh, yes, the prophet of dial-up. We were good friends back in the day. Tell her I said hello, would you? Okay, uh, back to our story. Demeter was the Greek goddess of agriculture, grain, and harvest. She loved many things. The earth, flowers, trees, humans. But most of all, she loved her daughter Persephone. Mater is actually the ancient Greek word for mother. Being a mother was so much of Demeter's identity that it was literally part of her name. Yeah, Demeter was a devoted and loving mother, and Persephone had a lovely childhood. The two had a very close relationship. Like me and my mother. Right, so you said. Our story begins when Persephone was a teenager and on the verge of starting life all on her own. She was kind, beautiful, and smart, and because she was so wonderful, she had many potential suitors that were eager to have Persephone's hand in marriage. But Demeter denied them all. Persephone was the great love of her life. She wanted the best possible husband for her beloved daughter. One of these many suitors was Hades. Hades is the Greek god of the dead. It is his job to oversee the underworld. Right. And although Hades is known for his callousness and overall cold and detached demeanor, he had a soft spot for Persephone. As I said, it was hard not to. She was fun and free-spirited, and she carried a sense of light and whimsy that was not seen in the underworld. So, naturally, Hades wanted Persephone for himself. 
he was determined to make Persephone his bride. But when he spoke to Demeter about it, she laughed in his face. Absolutely not, Demeter declared. My daughter is the most precious thing in the entire world. She belongs in the sun, not in the land of the dead and rotting, and she definitely does not belong with you. You may be the least worthy of all the suitors I've spoken with. Straightforward. I like it. Yes, Demeter was rather blunt, but there was one problem. She violated the golden rule of Greek mythology. Do not insult the gods. Exactly. Even if you are one. Demeter had taunted Hades, which made him all the more insistent on having Persephone for his wife. And unfortunately for Demeter, he knew just who to talk to about this problem. His brother, Zeus. Zeus, although married to the goddess Hera, was Persephone's father and the one who was ultimately responsible for approving Persephone's marriage partner. In many cultures, it was common to get permission from the parents first before proposing marriage. In some places, you didn't even need the person to say yes if their parents agreed. So Hades went to him to ask for her hand. You want to marry Persephone? Zeus was bewildered. But she's so young. She's so joyful and kind. She's, well, the exact opposite of you, actually. But that's why I need her in my life, Hades cried. In the underworld especially, she's the only one who has a chance to make that place bearable. She's the only one who could love me in the way I deserve. Hades pleaded his case to Zeus. He was desperate to make Persephone his bride. Now, astute listeners will remember that Zeus and Hades didn't exactly have the best of relationships. When dividing up kingdoms, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon drew metaphorical straws to determine who was in charge of what kingdom. Hades basically got the short straw and was made to oversee the underworld. Yes, and ever since that little debacle, their relationship had been on thin ice. While Zeus certainly hadn't lost any sleep over Hades' dreary lot in life, he wasn't opposed to improving their relationship, especially if all he had to do was marry off one of his daughters. There was just one small problem. Demeter. There was no way Demeter was going along with this plan. She could care less about the relationship between the two brothers. She wanted what was best for Persephone, and there was absolutely no way to convince her that Hades was it. So, Hades and Zeus decided to take matters into their own hands. One day, when Persephone and Demeter were out on one of their daily walks, Persephone noticed a particularly beautiful flower in the meadow. It was a Narcissus flower. Narcissus flowers are fragrant flowers that bloom anywhere between December and May, including daffodils, paper whites, and jonquils. You may remember their origin story, which we told in Season 1, Episode 4. While Demeter was busy tending to the grain and her other earthly harvest duties, Persephone bent down to examine the flower. As soon as she picked it up, the ground beneath her feet began to shake. A gigantic crack appeared in the ground, and Persephone watched in horror as animals, trees, and plants started to fall in. The crack grew larger and larger, and suddenly, out of the divide came a chariot pulled by enormous black horses. It was Hades. Persephone tried to run back to a frantic Demeter, but it was too late. Hades grabbed Persephone, pulled her onto the chariot, and raced back into the cold, dark earth. Persephone's cries for help echoed off the trees as the crack in the ground began to close back up. She was gone. Many modern versions of this story put this incident in a romantic light, but unfortunately, ancient sources just do not support that interpretation. Persephone did not want to leave her mother to go into the underworld. For a while, every tree, every bush, every blade of grass was still petrified, it seemed, by the events that had just occurred. Until Demeter let out what can only be described as a primal wail. 
She clawed at the earth where Persephone had vanished, digging as deep as she possibly could with her bare hands to try to get back to her daughter. When she had exhausted herself, she collapsed against the ground, devastated. Demeter could not imagine a life without Persephone. She remained on the ground for the next few weeks, unable to summon the will to even move. Meanwhile, Persephone had arrived in the underworld. Please let me go back. I want to live above the ground. I want to return to my mother. She wailed. This is your home now, Hades said. I will be your husband. You will be queen of the underworld. Persephone spent months trying to escape. She refused to make the underworld her home. She refused to open her heart to Hades. Instead, she dreamt of the sun on her skin and her mother's embrace. But over time, those memories began to hurt more than help. Sunshine wasn't an option for her anymore, and she started to really take in her surroundings. She spoke to the spirits of the newly dead and realized that life as a mortal especially the end of it, could be really hard. And those who were new to the realm of the dead needed comfort more than they needed anything else. So, without asking permission, she became a queen there after all. Persephone took on the responsibility of helping the newly dead transition into the afterlife. She spoke with them and held their hands and helped them find long-lost loved ones. Eventually, she had the thought that While she missed picking flowers and tagging along with her mother to temples and rituals, this work really made a difference. And so, Persephone threw herself into her new life. She not only ruled over the lost souls of the underworld, she made the underworld a better place to be. She took her rightful place next to Hades on the throne and became the Dark Queen. Devoted listeners of this show may recall several mentions of Persephone as Queen of the Underworld, including the episode about Orpheus and Eurydice from Season 2. Yeah, that's right. There are many Greek myths that touch on Persephone's rule as Queen of the Underworld. Okay, wow, look at the time. Where has the episode gone? We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back on the other side with more Greeking Out. Zeus the Mighty is back for another thrilling adventure in Book 3. This time, the overconfident hamster and his friends put their bravery to the test to see who will become the ultimate champion. The Trials of Harry Cleese is out now and available wherever books are sold. Go to bit.ly forward slash gozeus3 to find out more. That's bit.ly forward slash gozeus3. Book four is coming out in spring 2022. See, that wasn't so bad. Meanwhile, back above the ground, Demeter's grief was wreaking havoc on Earth. After a brief and strange baby-stealing incident, Demeter pretended to be a nurse for a royal child and was caught dangling him over the fire to, quote, burn the mortal out of him, unquote. Yeah, that was awkward. Demeter was hunkered down in her temple at Eleusis, not eating or drinking or sleeping, just brooding over the loss of her daughter. She refused to do any of her duties as goddess of grain and the harvest, and as a result, the ground began to dry up. There was no more harvest. Fruit rotted on the vine. Animals and humans began to starve from lack of food. And this continued for months. Demeter was simply not able to go on knowing that her daughter was in danger. Eventually, Zeus had no choice but to intervene. Humans were suffering because Demeter refused to hold up her end of the godly bargain. Demeter, he bellowed, what are you doing? You have to bring back the harvest. Innocent humans are dying. And what of Persephone, she exclaimed. She was as innocent as they come, and you let that horrible Hades swallow her up. Zeus pretended to deny knowledge of Hades' plan, but it didn't exactly work. What? This is the first I am hearing of all of this. Persephone's gone. How could this happen? Oh, don't act like you didn't know about this. She is your daughter. Had she truly been kidnapped, it would have started a war. You sold her off like cattle. You cared nothing for her fate. Zeus didn't want to admit it, but she was right. If Hades committed that kind of crime behind his back, Zeus would not have let the insult stand, but... 
Things could not continue this way. Humans were suffering. There would be no one left to rule over if he did nothing. What do you want me to do? He asked Demeter. Do you not even know that? She asked. It's simple. Bring her back. With a huff, Zeus headed back to Olympus to find his messenger, Hermes. Although he is the god of trade and luck, Hermes often served as messenger or emissary of the gods, especially Zeus. Hermes! Zeus bellowed. Go to the underworld and fetch Persephone. Tell Hades that... uh, Well, tell him something's come up. Meanwhile, Persephone was getting to know the ways of the underworld and appreciating the joy of bringing aid and comfort to the distressed. And Hades himself wasn't actually that bad after all. A little rough around the edges, sure, but not cruel or violent. He, too, was worried about the newly dead and was glad she'd taken on the task. When Hermes found her, Persephone was lounging in her chambers, preparing for a day of presiding over newly dead souls. Queen Persephone, it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Hermes began. I am Hermes, messenger of Zeus, and I am here to bring you back to your mother. Persephone stopped and looked at Hermes for the first time. My mother? Yes, she's uh, quite upset about your absence. Zeus would like me to bring you back to her. Oh, Persephone said. She thought of her mother and how much she missed her, but the thought was drowned out by the sense of responsibility she now felt for the dead who would be arriving today. If she wasn't here to tend to them, who would? Hades? Being comforting wasn't exactly his strong suit. I am sorry, Hermes, but please let Zeus know that I am needed down here. I have responsibilities now. Really? You want to stay here? (laughs) I mean, it's just so... Dark? Yes, I know. But you get used to it. I kind of like it, actually. Perplexed, Hermes returned to Zeus and told him about Persephone's desire to remain in the underworld. Well, whatever you do, do not tell that to Demeter. She'll burn down the whole planet if she thinks Persephone's abandoned her. Go convince Persephone to come back with you. I'd like to speak to her. So when Hermes returned a few days later, Persephone laughed at his arrival. (laughs) Are you here to try to change my mind again? Listen, Persephone, Hermes began. I I know you enjoy being queen. I... I know royalty has its perks, even if your kingdom is a little graveyard, but your mother truly misses you. Don't you remember what it was like when you were together? Don't you miss having someone to confide in, to laugh with, to love? Well, Hades is here, Persephone replied. Yeah, and we all know that he's the life of the party, Hermes laughed. (laughs) Come back with me. Run through the meadows. Feel the sun on your face. Let the grass tickle your feet. Give your mother a hug. Persephone sighed. She'd found a place for herself in the world that had nothing to do with her mother. She had taken a bad situation and turned it into something that worked for her, where she was making a real difference. Against all odds, Persephone was happy here. She couldn't deny that. But she did miss the sun. She did miss dancing in fields and the smell of flowers. She missed the stars, she missed the wind, but most of all, she missed her mother. She couldn't deny it. Her heart would always have a hole in it that only Demeter could fill. Without her, Persephone's life would always feel incomplete. She didn't know what she was going to do, but she agreed to meet with Zeus. Maybe he could help clear up some of the confusion she felt in her heart. Just then, Hades burst through the door in a fiery rage. Hermes, he exclaimed, leave my queen alone. She wants to come with me. She's not happy here. And besides, it's Zeus's orders. Hades stared at Persephone. You're not happy? I am happy. I'm just not complete. I miss my mother. Hades knew what was going on. Demeter would never stop fighting for Persephone, and Persephone would never be able to deny the pull of her mother. He could not have her all to himself. But that didn't mean Hades couldn't have her at all. Wait a minute, Hades said. Before you go, 
eat this. In his hand was a pomegranate. In Greek mythology, the pomegranate is said to be the fruit of the dead. Persephone looked at it skeptically. She was no fool, and she'd been in the underworld long enough to know the rules. In fact, Hades himself had told her this one. Eating the food of the dead meant you had to stay in the underworld. Hades was trying to ensure that she would come back. So without hesitation, she ate only a small handful of the ruby-red pomegranate seeds. She didn't know what would happen next, but the underworld was a place she could grow and bloom, and she wanted that for herself. Whatever will be, will be, she whispered, as she said her goodbyes to Hades. Hermes immediately took her to Mount Olympus, where Zeus was waiting for her. Technically, pomegranates are berries, as are bananas, cucumbers, and eggplants, strawberries, and raspberries, on the other hand, are not technically berries. When they arrived, Zeus greeted them warmly. Persephone, you have caused quite the ruckus with your shenanigans. Demeter desperately wants you back home with her. I'm glad you've decided to see sense. Persephone paused as she considered her answer. She kind of resented Zeus's assumption that she was like a child throwing a temper tantrum, but she knew that yelling at Zeus would get her nowhere. She was beginning to understand what she wanted, and she was forming a plan to get it. Oh, good King Zeus, what a wonderful idea! But before I left the underworld, I ate some pomegranate seeds. That's not going to be a problem, is it? What? Zeus was not happy about this, and after much pacing and worrying and talking to himself, he finally turned back to Persephone. All right, he said. I have a plan. Yes? Persephone asked sweetly. You have to go back to the underworld because of the seeds you ate. There's no point in arguing it. It's a rule even I can't break. But... Since you only ate a couple of small seeds, you only have to go for part of the year. The rest of it, you can spend on Earth with your mother. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that'll work, yes. Whatever you think is best, Persephone said. And so it was that Persephone would spend half the year with Demeter and the other half with Hades. Some myths say that Hades tricked Persephone into eating the seeds. Yeah, there is some debate about whether or not Persephone ever truly felt at home in the underworld. Some versions of the myth claim that she was miserable the entire time and that she wanted nothing more than to return to Demeter. Some say she truly embraced her new kingdom and didn't want to leave the underworld at all. Was she a victim, a dark queen, or maybe a combination of the two? I suppose we'll never know for sure, but we like to think that, like all of us, Persephone had both light and dark inside of her. She was able to see the good in both places, even somewhere as dark and dreary as the underworld. She appreciated the change, just like we appreciate the change in seasons. Speaking of seasons, the decision for Persephone to spend half of the year on Earth and half of the year in the underworld is the Greek mythology explanation behind the change in weather and seasons. Yeah, because while Persephone was here on Earth, Demeter was overjoyed. Flowers grew, the sun shone brightly, their combined love brought the world into bloom. And that time of year is now what is commonly referred to as spring and summer. But when Persephone left to live with Hades, the leaves fell from the trees. The temperature dropped, the ground grew cold, autumn and winter ruled the Earth while Persephone was in the underworld, and Demeter grieved the loss of her daughter all over again. And that is how it remained, and still remains, to this day. Is that the end of the story? Yeah, I believe it is. Why? I'm going to go call my mom now. Oh, that's so sweet. Has anyone seen my Ethernet cable? Breaking out! That's the end of our story today. Be sure to check back in a week for the next episode, which will include a special bonus at the end. What could it be? Listen and you'll see it scream. National Geographic Kids Greeking Out is written by Kenny Curtis and Jillian Hughes and hosted by Kenny Curtis, with Tori Kerr as the Oracle of Wi-Fi. 
audio production and sound design by Scotty Beam, and our theme song was composed by Perry Grip. Dr. Diane Klein is our subject matter expert, and Emily Everhart is our producer. The stories featured in Greeking Out are original adaptations of classic Greek myths. Today's story features bad decisions, using potions to solve your problems, unrequited love, a sea change, and personal growth. Greeking Out, the greatest stories in history were told in Greek mythology. Greeking Out, gods and heroes, amazing feats. Listen and you'll see it's Hey, Oracle, do you like magic? I do not believe in magic. Wait, we've been doing this for how long and I'm just finding out now that you don't believe in magic? I prefer to believe that magic is just science we do not yet understand. Huh, I never thought of it that way. Well, okay, today's episode is all about magic or science we do not yet understand. And before there were all those popular books and movies about witches and wizards, there were powerful sorcerers known to do supernatural and mysterious things. Today's episode is all about Circe, or as the ancient Greeks called her, Kirki, one of the most magical characters in Greek mythology. But Circe's powers weren't always respected. In fact, growing up, her family just thought she was kind of strange. They didn't make much of an effort to get to know her at all, and Circe spent a lot of time alone trying to understand her magical powers. You see, Circe was born into a particularly noble family. She was the daughter of the god Helios. Helios was the god of the sun. He's said to have driven a fiery chariot of light from east to west across the sky every day. He was featured in an early episode of Greeking Out. That's right! And Circe's mother was the Oceanid named Perse. Oceanids are goddess nymphs. They are known for their beauty. Yes, but unfortunately, Circe did not inherit the kind of beauty that Oceanids are known for possessing. She also had a voice that was said to have squawked like a bird when she talked. This might have been how Circe earned her name. In Greek, the word Circe translates to bird. Because of this... Circe had a rather lonely childhood. She was often left out or forgotten. And while her family ignored her and continued to go about their business, Circe began to practice the fine art of sorcery. She discovered that she had a particular talent and passion for potion making, and she spent her days carefully brewing her concoctions. She also practiced spell casting and began to use small magic against those who offended her. But as Circe's power began to grow her reputation started to plummet. She had never really been appreciated by her family, but now she was more or less despised. Her family was threatened by her magic and suspicious of her newfound power. They didn't like that she had a gift that they did not possess, and they were scared of what she might do with it. And then she met a mortal named Glaucus, and things went from bad to worse. The first time she met him, He was standing on the beach, staring out towards the ocean. Circe hesitated. She had never met a mortal before, and everyone in her family seemed to dislike her. Was it worth it to introduce herself to another creature? Why put herself through the pain of yet another rejection? But Circe was intrigued. Maybe she could learn things from this new person. Uh, hello there, she called out to him. Upon seeing Circe, Glaucus immediately fell to his knees. Beautiful goddess, he said. I I am sorry to disturb you. I was was just admiring your beaches, looking for fish. I I I will leave immediately. Circe paused. No one had ever called her beautiful before. Stay. Please, there is much we can discuss. And there are fish over there, she said, pointing to a shallow pond in the distance. Well, the two hit it off immediately. Glaucus was in awe of Circe's beauty and wisdom, and... Circe found the attention rather flattering. She liked learning about mankind and its discoveries. The pair continued to meet every day for months. One day, Glaucus came to Circe with a request. Goddess Circe, he began, I have loved spending time with you. I I, I am in awe of your magic. I have seen you do amazing things. So I wonder if you might be able to do an amazing thing for me. What would you like? 
I need to leave soon. I, I have to go fish in a different corner of the world. But I wish to stay here with you. But the only way to do that is for me to become immortal. Otherwise, I will always be tied down to my human life and responsibilities. Cersei was floored. She had never considered the possibility of turning Glaucus into an immortal. She had never attempted such magic. She doubted she would be strong enough to do it. Here is a fun fact about immortality. Around the 9th century, Tang Dynasty alchemists created the recipe for gunpowder while trying to create a substance that would give people eternal life. Ironically, gunpowder would go on to kill millions of people for centuries to come. Wow, they really missed the mark there. But Circe loved spending time with Glaucus. She loved how she felt in his presence, seen and valued. She didn't want him to leave. And at that moment, she realized that she would do just about anything to make him stay. I will try, she replied. And for the next few days, Circe worked around the clock to make an immortality potion for Glaucus. Despite her best efforts, nothing was working. Suddenly, she had a flash of inspiration. Not a potion, she exclaimed to herself. An herb. There has to be a magical herb that already has immortality properties. According to common definition, herbs are a widely distributed and widespread group of plants with savory or aromatic properties that are used for flavoring and garnishing food, for medicinal purposes, and for fragrances. So, like, basil? Yes, basil is a culinary herb, but I think it is safe to say that it does not give its consumers immortality. Right, okay, so Cersei was on the hunt for a special rare herb that had the power to provide never-ending life. And because she had become a skilled sorceress with decades of experience under her belt, she actually found it. This is it! She exclaimed. This is the herb that will help Glaucus become immortal. Long-time listeners will know that Gilgamesh also received an herb that would prolong life. That's right. And at that moment, Cersei realized that she loved Glaucus. Truly loved him. Not love like a friend kind of love, but love like a romantic kind of love. She would make him immortal, and they would spend forever together. Literally. When Glaucus ate the plant and turned into an immortal, he was ecstatic. He swung Cersei around in the air enthusiastically. You did it! He screamed. You really did it! Cersei wanted to tell him that she had fallen in love with him, but she found that she couldn't get the words out. She also wanted to introduce him to her family so that he would be accepted, or at least acknowledged, as a fellow immortal. She had no idea if her family would welcome him, but she shouldn't have worried. It turned out that her family was more than willing to accept a handsome new god into their world. The nymphs were beside themselves at the thought of a new romantic prospect. Her father even threw a welcome dinner in Glaucus's honor. So Glaucus spent the night eating amazing food and meeting all the gods and goddesses. He was overjoyed. Circe, meanwhile, was ignored as usual. Still, she was not willing to let a difficult night ruin her forever. Circe got up the next morning ready to talk with Glaucus and confess her love. She couldn't wait to finally be together. But when she went to the beach that morning, Glaucus wasn't there. She searched for him in all the usual places, but she couldn't find him anywhere. Eventually, she saw him sitting in the waiting pool next to a nymph named Scylla. When he noticed Circe watching from behind the trees, Glaucus leapt up and ran to her. Circe, he began. I have some exciting news. She paused. Yes? I... I'm in love. Cersei waited, her heart thumping in her chest. Go on, she said. I am in love with Scylla. We met last night. She is the one for me. I know it. I just know it. And this is all because you turned me immortal. Cersei froze. She couldn't think. She couldn't move. She couldn't breathe. The rejection rippled through her body like a gust of wind. He did not love her. He did not want her. He loved Scylla instead. She was more beautiful, more gentle, everything Circe was not. I, I know it's insensitive of me to ask for yet another request, 
But is it possible for you to help Skilla agree to marry me? Maybe you could brew another one of your love potions, perhaps? I feel obligated to point out that if you need a potion to make someone marry you, then they are not actually agreeing to marry you. Fair point. Cersei stared at Glaucus in disbelief. How could he ask this of her? And then, soon enough, her disbelief morphed into anger. Yes, Cersei said slowly. I'm sure there is something I can do to rectify the situation. That night, Cersei was tormented by jealousy. Why didn't Glaucus love her? What had she done to be ignored like this? Why wasn't she ever enough? Haunted by these thoughts, Cersei brewed the potion for Glaucus, but it wasn't a love potion. In fact, it was the exact opposite. This was Cersei's most dangerous potion yet. As if in a trance, Cersei brought the potion to Glaucus the next morning. Here is the potion. Use it wisely. Oh, Cersei, Glaucus cried. How will I ever repay you? I'm sure you'll think of something, Cersei said with a smile. And although Cersei was still angry and heartbroken, she was beginning to feel a little guilty about the effects her potion would have. You did nothing wrong, Cersei said to herself. What Glaucus does with the potion is his decision. What happens next is his responsibility. Cersei walked to Scylla's bathing pool and hid behind the reeds. She watched as Glaucus strutted over and poured the potion directly into the water. He smiled and laughed, ready to enjoy his day. He didn't even have the decency to stay and see what happened next. He'd rather wait for his future bride to find him. Cersei shook her head in disbelief. A few hours later, Scylla came to take her daily bath in the pool. She undressed and stood by the water's edge, a picture of beauty. And then she slowly walked into the water. Suddenly, the pool turned black and began to swirl. Scylla started to thrash around like a wild animal. Cersei leapt from her spot behind the reeds and stared down with horror. She had meant to punish Glaucus, but now that the moment was here, she was overcome with regret. How could she do this to an innocent being? What kind of a person was she? She tried to reach into the water, but before she could act, the thrashing stopped. The water stilled and began to clear. And then, from deep beneath the waters, emerged a monster. Scylla looked nothing like her former self. She had six long necks with bulging eyes and gnashing teeth. Gone were her slender legs, and in their place was the tail of a sea serpent, surrounded by what appeared to be the legs of a dog. This creature was the exact opposite of a nymph. It was huge. It was ferocious. It was the deadliest sea monster that Cersei had ever seen. And when the monster locked eyes with Cersei, she felt her heart drop. Skilla. She whispered. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. I will send you back, I promise. I'll figure out a way. But before Cersei could finish her sentence, the gods came crashing onto the scene, ready to fight this terrifying new monster. Scylla roared her heads in anger and ran to the ocean, knocking a few gods down on her way. She launched herself into the sea and swam underwater as far away as possible, never to be seen again. False. Scylla goes on to become one of the deadliest monsters in Greek mythology. In fact, we mention her in Season 1, Episode 3, entitled Ancient Greek Monster Mash. Wait a second, whoa. This is the same Scylla as that sea monster? Yes. Oh, man. Yeah, well, I guess we know how things turn out for Scylla, which, to be fair, is good if you're a sea monster, but pretty bad if you're a nymph. Cersei was devastated by her ability to cause so much pain and suffering. She felt unbearable shame. According to Brene Brown, a researcher at the University of Houston, shame is an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. And that was exactly how Cersei was feeling, unworthy of love and belonging. She tried to shake away these feelings. She tried to tell herself that this was all Glaucus's fault. He asked for a potion. He was going to hold Scylla against her will. 
If he hadn't approached Cersei, this would never have happened. But unfortunately for Cersei, her father and the rest of the kingdom found her to be at fault. She was exiled from her home and sent to the island of Aia, where she could do no harm to anyone ever again. Aia's modern-day location is unknown, but many experts believe it could be located off the coast of Italy. And even though Cersei was being punished for her crime, the island wasn't too shabby. She had her own stone mansion with every possible luxury and accommodation. She had a huge garden filled with plants and herbs. She even had a few nymphs to act as her servants. Not too bad of a punishment, if you ask me. And it was here on Aia that Cersei lived out most of her days and had incredible adventures. There are so many stories that we could tell about Cersei and her sorcery, but instead we're going to focus on a key plot point in her very long, very complicated, and very magical life, Odysseus. Now, fans of Greek mythology know who Odysseus is. He's kind of a big deal. Odysseus is the hero of the epic poem written by Homer called The Odyssey. He is famous for his journey, or Odyssey, home after fighting in the Trojan War. Yes, and we could dedicate an entire episode or two, or dare I say season, to Odysseus and the Trojan War, but today's story comes at the tail end of his journey. Now, you may remember how in a previous episode about Odysseus, we talked about what happened next. His men made a complete mess of her home, so she turned them into pigs. But Odysseus and Circe really hit it off. In fact, they liked each other so much that eventually their friendship transformed into a full-fledged relationship. Soon enough, Circe and Odysseus were officially a couple. In today's culture, they would be considered a power couple. That consists of two people who are each successful in their own right. And that's exactly what they were. Their relationship was special. They spent every day with each other on Aia and quickly became each other's closest confidant. It had been a long time since Cersei had let herself be happy. And now that Odysseus was here, she never wanted him to leave. So when he came to her one night and told her that he had to continue his journey home to Ithaca, she was devastated. But why can't you stay here? We're happy! I am happy, but I am on a quest. And my quest ends in Ithaca. Ithaca is a Greek island located in the Ionian Sea to the west of continental Greece. Circe understood. She had known it from the moment she met him. Odysseus had a mission he needed to complete. She also suspected that Odysseus had a wife and maybe even a family back at home in Ithaca. They had never discussed it, but she assumed it was highly likely. The thought of Odysseus returning to another woman made Circe sick with jealousy. Odysseus was, in fact, married to a woman named Penelope. They had one child together, a son named Telemachus. Penelope had been faithfully waiting for Odysseus's return for years. Circe felt her heart begin to harden towards Odysseus. She couldn't help but feel like he was choosing to spend his days with someone else. Still, Circe helped him and his crew as they got ready to sail. She told him all about Scylla and even gave him advice on how to get past her. She tried her best to calm her anger and her sadness at being left behind. It seemed like no one actually wanted to stay with her. And when the day came for Odysseus to finally leave, Circe was heartbroken, but also greatly relieved. Loving people was too risky. She was better off on her own. She didn't want to be tethered to anyone else ever again. A few weeks later, Circe realized she was pregnant. Circe and Odysseus had a child together, a son named Telegonus. Wait, hold on. Isn't that the name of his son with Penelope? No, you are thinking of Telemachus. Well, that's confusing. Anyway, Circe raised Telegonus all by herself on the abandoned island of Aia. And although she swore off romantic love for good after Odysseus left, she was completely bowled over by her feelings of love and affection for her son. Motherhood suited her. She would do anything for her son, anything at all. For the first time in her life, she felt true, pure, reciprocal love. She was the happiest she had ever been. But as the years passed, 
Telegonus became more and more interested in who his father was. Circe told him that he was a great warrior, a brilliant man who had done many important things, but Telegonus wasn't satisfied with that answer. Why wasn't his father here with them? Was he ever going to come back? Did he even know he had a son? And as Telegonus asked all of these questions, Circe found herself getting angrier about the situation. Why wasn't Odysseus here? Why wasn't she worth staying around for? And why was he still causing her all this pain after all this time? And worst of all, why did he have to cause her son pain as well? So when Telegonus came to her one day and asked to go to Ithaca to find his father and get answers, Circe agreed. It seemed her son was just as angry with his father as she was, and that kind of made her feel justified in her own anger. I cannot leave Aia, she told him. But you can. Go. Find your father. But Circe was worried about her son going out into the world. He had never left the island. What would happen to him? What if he was hurt or injured? And how would Odysseus react? What if Telegonus needed to protect himself? The night before he left on his journey, Circe gave Telegonus a spear tipped with the point of a stingray. A stingray tail is sharp and releases venom into the wound. They can, at times, be fatal. Circe knew it was a risk to give her untrained son such a dangerous weapon, but he needed to be able to keep himself safe. And besides, she reasoned, Telegonus was a grown man. What he did with the spear was his choice and responsibility. It wasn't her fault if he hurt someone. He had to take responsibility himself. The next morning, Circe cried as Telegonus set sail in the direction of Ithaca. Please let him return, she whispered. Please, please, please. After a grueling journey, Telegonus made it to the shores of Ithaca. He was starving after his long trip and was looking forward to eating something other than fish. He found a flock of sheep grazing nearby and took one for his dinner. That night, as he was roasting lamb over a fire, he saw a man running towards him down the beach. What have you done? The man screamed at Telegonus. I'm just eating some lamb for dinner, he explained. Eating sheep is against the law. You should know that. Telegonus tried to explain that he was a visitor who had just arrived in Ithaca a few hours ago, but the man would not listen. He continued to yell at Telegonus. He was out of his mind with anger and could not be calmed down no matter how much Telegonus tried. Leave now, Telegonus cried, but the man would not leave. He began to push Telegonus and drew a sword from his waist. Before Telegonus could process what was happening, the man was chasing him around the fire with his sword, threatening to kill him. Telegonus grabbed the only weapon he had, his poisoned spear, and thrust it into the man's chest. Now, this wouldn't have been a fatal wound, but remember, the spear was poisoned. The man began to convulse and shake on the ground. He took one last breath, and then he was gone. Telegonus sank to his knees. He hadn't meant to kill this man. He didn't even know why he was being attacked. He had never taken another man's life before, and he was overcome with guilt and shame. And of course, you know what happened here. It is imprecise to make assumptions. Okay, okay, then I'll tell you. The man Telegonus killed was his own father, Odysseus. Penelope... Odysseus's wife was the one to tell him when she found him crying over the body of her husband. She hadn't known the young man was her husband's son, but she listened to his story with compassion and was truly sorry for his pain. To search for your father a whole lifetime, only to kill him on your first meeting, was an enormous burden. Of course, Penelope was devastated by the loss of Odysseus as well. But the truth is, he hadn't been the same person when he'd come home from his journey. His odyssey. A sea change is a device used in storytelling when a character goes to sea and comes back very different on the inside. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Right. And whether it was the horrors of war or the 20-year journey back home or whatever, Odysseus had not been okay for a while. Everyone in Ithaca walked on eggshells around him. Penelope was a practical person, and she couldn't help but think what came next here. This young man should not have to suffer for what was clearly self-defense. She knew how her husband could be. But Odysseus was the king of Ithaca, 
and so Telegonus would be punished for his death. Also, she remembered her time without Odysseus in Ithaca, and to say it was unpleasant was an understatement. She had been hounded by suitors for 20 years who ate her food, destroyed her house, and were mean to her son. She didn't want to go through that again. So she came up with a plan. When Circe saw Telegonus' boat in the distance, she was incredibly relieved, but also nervous. Would Odysseus be with him? Did he embrace his newfound son? Would Telegonus be happy, or would he be crushed by rejection the same way Circe herself had been? When the boat finally made it to the shore, Circe saw that Telegonus was not alone. Two other figures were with him on the boat. When Telegonus saw his mother, he sprinted to her side and threw his arms around her in a way he hadn't done since he was a child. I killed him, Telegonus whispered. I killed Odysseus. Circe continued to comfort her son, but she was devastated that Odysseus was really gone for good. She couldn't believe she would never again be able to talk with him or tell him about their son. She didn't know what to think, but she knew this was not her son's fault. When Telegonus finally stopped crying, he motioned to the shore where Penelope and Telemachus stood in the distance. That's Penelope and Telemachus. They are Odysseus's wife and son. Their kind hearts are the only reason that I'm not in jail. Circe was shocked. Odysseus's wife was here on Aea? What did she want? And why had she saved Telegonus from his terrible fate in Ithaca? Penelope slowly made her way over and introduced herself and her son. Your son has told us about him. We thought it would be best to bury Odysseus here, where he was happy. Circe was surprised at Penelope's grace and eloquence. She thought Penelope would despise her, but the woman was greeting her kindly. Circe decided to treat her with the same respect. Thank you for making sure my son got home safe. Please, come inside and have something to eat. Later that evening, Penelope and Circe got a chance to talk by the fire. The two quickly realized they had a lot in common and were surprised by how natural the friendship felt. Penelope told Circe about her life in Ithaca without Odysseus and how she had taken her son to start a new life somewhere else. Circe was racked with guilt and regret. She could finally admit that she bore responsibility for the things she did, not just giving Telegonus the poison spear and sending him to find his unpredictable father, but prolonging Penelope's suffering by keeping Odysseus away and even forgiving Glaucus the potion for Scylla. It didn't matter what her intentions were. The outcome was the same. Her son was devastated and had to carry the guilt of killing his own father. Penelope was mourning her husband and had left her home. Telemachus would never get a chance to become closer to his father. And Circe would never again speak to Odysseus. Her actions had hurt everyone. But she could learn from this decision. She could decide to no longer be a person who seeks revenge at any cost. She could let herself soften. She could let herself change. And so she did. This is called personal growth. It means improving your behavior and habits and becoming the best version of yourself. That's true, Oracle. And Circe did undergo a great deal of personal growth. She transformed into the kind of person she had always wanted to become. She invited Penelope and Telemachus to live on the island with her, and the four of them, Circe, Penelope, Telemachus, and Telegonus, spent decades together on Aea and became sort of a family all on their own. Circe thought she would hate Penelope, but they ended up becoming best friends. And as Penelope and Telemachus began to grow older, Circe realized that she had the perfect opportunity to atone for all the harm that she had caused Odysseus's family. Would you like to become immortal? She asked Penelope one evening. Penelope was shocked by the question. She certainly wasn't expecting to find eternal life here on Aea. But Penelope was happy there, and so was her son. So she decided to take Circe up on her offer. And that is the story of how Circe somehow stumbled upon the true definition of love. It was friendship. It was family. It was choosing to be there for someone no matter what. And that is how she chose to live out her days. No potion required. Well, technically, 
she did need to brew a potion to make them all immortal. Okay, I guess that's true. But you know what I mean. The love part didn't require any potion or magical acts. Maybe love is a form of magic in and of itself. You know, Oracle, you might just be right about that. Breaking out. That's it for season five. Grab a parent and let us know what you want to hear more of in the reviews. More mythology from other places? More adventure stories? More stories with snakes in them? What other podcasts would you like to hear from Nat Geo Kids? We read all the reviews, so let us know. We're already hard at work making a great season six, releasing April 2022. Listen and you'll see it's out. National Geographic Kids Greeking Out is written by Kenny Curtis and Jillian Hughes and hosted by Kenny Curtis with Tori Kerr as the Oracle of Wi-Fi, audio production and sound design by Scotty Beam, and our theme song was composed by Perry Grip. Dr. Diane Klein is our subject matter expert, and Emily Everhart is our producer. The stories featured in Greeking Out are original adaptations of classic Greek myths. This week's story features comical amounts of dung, fraternal twins, an uncontrollable destructive rage, and snakes. And we all know how the Oracle feels about snakes. Breaking out the greatest stories in history were told in Greek mythology. Breaking out gods and heroes, amazing feats. Listen and you'll see it's Breaking Out. The Goat of Greek Mythology, Part 1. Our story today is not about farm animals. It's not goat, bah, goat, it's G-O-A-T, as in greatest of all time. The greatest hero in all of Greek mythology. He is the LeBron James of ancient Greece, the Usain Bolt of Olympus, the Serena Williams of Thebes. If someone asked you to name one hero from Greek mythology, what's the first name that would pop into your head? That's right. Heracles. Hercules. Right. Her wait, wait, hold on, wait, what? Heracles. It's Hercules, isn't it? No, Hercules is the Latin name for the same person. But Heracles is how it's pronounced in the original Greek. It means famous because of Hera. The Romans later adapted these same stories, but called the hero Hercules instead. But more people today know him as Hercules. True, but the name of this podcast is Greeking Out, so we should use the original version, don't you think? If it was called Roman Around, then maybe we could go with Hercules. Okay, fair point. Thank you. And I like the Roman Around thing. Can I use that? Knock yourself out. Okay, all right. So, you probably already know a little bit about Hercules. He was... Really? Uh, Her 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 Heracles, Heracles, sorry, Heracles. <clears throat> Heracles was born half mortal, half god, a demigod, as it was called. Like a lot of heroes in these stories, he was the son of Zeus and a mortal woman named Alcmene who happened to be the granddaughter of the great hero Perseus and was married to a decent guy named Amphitryon. Now, if you've been following these stories already, you'll know that Zeus's wife Hera didn't like him spending a lot of time with other ladies, and he did that a lot. So it's understandable that she would be jealous, but she often took her anger out on the children of Zeus as opposed to the god himself. Zeus was the king of the gods, after all. He could kind of do whatever he wanted and no one could stop him, but Hera was tricky. The night before Heracles was to be born, Zeus was bragging all over Olympus about his new son and how he would be the greatest of all of the descendants of Perseus. And this is when Hera decided to have her revenge. She egged Zeus on daring him to back up his boasts with actions. So, the king of the gods proclaimed, The next child to be born in the house of Perseus would become a high king of the mortals. And that the one that was born right after him would be his servant. But Zeus didn't know that Heracles was about to have a cousin. Hera immediately left Olympus and traveled to Argos, where she caused the wife of the king of Argos to give birth to her baby early. The baby was a boy, and his name was Eurystheus. He was born small and sickly and weak, but by Zeus's decree, he was to be the new ruler. And now Hercules was... Heracles. Sorry. And now Heracles was bound to serve him. Zeus was obviously furious about all of this, but, of course, he couldn't violate his own oath. So instead, 
He made a deal with Hera. He made her promise that if Heracles performed enough great works in the service of King Eurystheus, that he would become immortal and could join the gods. Hera agreed. I mean, if Eurystheus got to decide what these great works were going to be, then little Heracles was bound to have a hard road ahead of him. But Hera was in for a surprise, too. It turns out that Alcmene actually delivered two babies. Didn't know that Herc had a twin brother, did you? The first was Heracles, and he was a demigod. <laughs> the second was Iphicles, who was not a demigod. Although they looked alike as babies, Heracles and Iphicles are not identical twins. They would be fraternal twins. But even so, as infants, it was almost impossible to tell which baby was which. So Hera decided upon a test. One night, when the babies were still very young, Hera sent two snakes into their bed. Iphicles cried at the sight of the snakes in his crib, but Heracles reacted differently. He immediately snatched up the snakes, knocked their heads together, and flung them out of the crib. This is an irresponsible use of snakes. I know, Oracle, I know, I know. But this is how Hera found out which one of the twins was the demigod. Heracles was raised by his mother and his stepdad in the city of Thebes. But Zeus was still sort of in the picture. He made sure his son had the best tutors as he grew up. Heracles' stepfather taught him to drive a chariot. But Heracles was taught how to wrestle by Odysseus' grandfather. He was taught how to shoot a bow by the king of Achalia. The legendary Castor taught him how to use a sword. And the son of the god Hermes taught him how to box. He also learned to read and write and sing from Linus, one of the muses' sons. So basically, he had personal tutors for every subject and never had to Zoom class even once. And over time, Heracles actually became better than his teachers at just about every subject. See what a good education can do? Exactly. And having a powerful godfather, literally, helps a lot, too. But of course, Heracles was also still a kid, and he had chores to do, one of which involved keeping an eye on his stepfather's cattle while they were grazing in the fields. One morning, when Heracles went up to the fields to bring the herd back, he discovered that a number of oxen had been killed by a huge lion. Heracles had heard stories of this devious lion. Even the king next door complained of this beast that preyed upon the innocent creatures in his kingdom. Lions lived in Europe many centuries ago. Today, the only lions outside of Africa are Asiatic lions who still live in India's Gir Forest. While they are considered endangered, with only 500 left in the wild, their population is trending towards stable. Heracles decided to put a stop to it. He hunted for 50 days for the creature. Aided in the hunt by the king's fierce daughters, Heracles finally caught and killed the mighty lion. Afterwards, Heracles took the skin of the lion and made it into a cloak, and he even wore the lion's scalp on his head like a helmet. It became kind of a trademark thing for him. After the hunt, Heracles was bringing the herd back down the mountain when he was stopped by four soldiers sent by another king, King Erkinus of Minos, and they were collecting their annual tribute of a hundred cows. This had been going on for years. The people of Thebes were being bullied by the neighboring kingdom into paying them off or risk having their homes destroyed, their crops burned, etc., etc., etc. Heracles knew all of this, but let's face it, he had just killed a huge lion to protect this herd. He wasn't about to just give it up to some big bully who wanted what wasn't his. So, not surprisingly, there was a fight. Even outnumbered, Heracles was able to best the four soldiers. In fact, one legend claims that he sent the soldiers marching back to their king with their ears and noses cut off. Your ears and your nose continue to grow your whole life because they are made of cartilage. Bones and muscles stop expanding after puberty, but not cartilage. That's why older people have larger noses and ears. It probably won't be a problem. For these guys. Well, this didn't go over well with King Archinus. He was furious, and he sent the entire Minian army to Thebes to retaliate. This was not well received by everybody in town. I mean, all of a sudden, this kid in a lion suit picks a fight with some soldiers, and now we're in a war? 
Heracles' stepfather stood by his stepson and defended his actions, even rallying soldiers and organizing men into troops to fight the Minions. And Heracles was determined to prove his worth and make things right. He prayed to the gods for help, and on the evening before the battle, Athena herself appeared to Heracles and offered to lend him a suit of her enchanted armor to wear under his lion skin. Since Athena was the goddess of battle and strategy, you know her armor was going to be special. Heracles led this small group of soldiers from Thebes against the Minian forces and won. It was a long battle. Heracles was surrounded for much of the time, but he swung his club again and again, knocking back the enemy every time. His spear and his sword were just as dangerous, and his armor was impenetrable. Eventually... King Archenus realized his forces were outmatched, and he instructed the few soldiers he had left to throw down their arms and surrender. Heracles had won, but he had also lost something, too. His stepfather had died fighting in the great battle, and Heracles and Iphicles had a great funeral in his honor. Now, Heracles was a bona fide hero. As part of the terms of the surrender, Heracles demanded that the Minions actually start paying tribute to Thebes instead of the other way around. And Thebes loved him. The king of Thebes loved him. He got engaged and married to the princess Megara. And the gods gave him amazing gifts, too. Hermes gave him a sword, Apollo a bow and arrows, and Hephaestus gave him a golden coat of chainmail. Everything was going great for Heracles. And this was more than Hera could take, honestly. His fame and fortune were driving her crazy. So she decided to do the same to him. Some say it was the fame and power going to his head. Others say he just missed fighting too much, but it was really the goddess Hera whispering an evil spell into his ear while he slept that drove Heracles to madness and destruction. He turned into a monster. Without explanation, Heracles started destroying everything in his path. His home, his wife, his family, everything. He was like a force of nature that just ripped everything to pieces. The people of Thebes hid from him as he raged through the streets, yelling and smashing things. And days later, when he came to his senses, he found himself alone with his armor and his weapons and no idea what to do next. You know, I think maybe this is a good place to take a break and regroup. Believe me, Heracles is thinking the same thing. Commercial break, everybody? We good? Adventure, danger, and a thrilling global mission await 12-year-old Cruz Coronado as he joins an elite school for explorers. Follow Cruz and his friends as they navigate classes, augmented reality expeditions, code breaking, and the biggest question of all, who is out to get Cruz and why? Check out the series at bit.ly forward slash creaking X. That's bit.ly forward slash G R E E K I N G E X. So, what do the ancient Greeks do when they don't know what else to do? Ask the Oracle. Heracles left Thebes, heartbroken and shame faced, and traveled to the Oracle at Delphi to ask for advice. She told Heracles that he should go to his cousin Eurystheus, the king of tyrants, and serve him as the gods had decreed years ago. Heracles was devastated by what happened in Thebes. He longed to make up for the horrible things he had done, so he journeyed all the way to tyrants and pledged to serve his cousin, King Eurystheus, as long as he could also rid the world of evil. Tyrans is a real place dating back more than 4,000 years. It's located in southern Greece on a peninsula called the Peloponnesus. It was once marked by a massive hilltop palace and fort with great stone walls that were rumored to be built by a cyclops. Naturally, Eurystheus was more than happy to accept Heracles as his servant. Now remember, Eurystheus was the baby that Hera had tricked Zeus with. (laughs) She used her godlike influence to cause Eurystheus' mother to go into labor early. As a result, he was born small and weak and had some health problems his whole life. Yes, He was king, but when the mighty Heracles appeared before him with his hero's jaw and strapping frame and his Olympus-given good looks, well, I'm pretty sure that Eurystheus was probably at least a little jealous. That might explain why he gave Heracles such a hard time. 
Perhaps the goddess Hera whispered in his ear a bit too, but either way, Eurystheus laid out a hard road for Heracles. He instructed our hero to perform ten heroic tasks, which were also called labors, before he could fulfill his oath. Naturally, a lot of this involved fighting monsters, but Herc also wound up wrangling horses, retrieving cattle, fetching magical fruit, even stealing somebody's girdle, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The first task that Eurystheus laid out for Heracles was to kill another lion and bring the skin back to tyrants. This might not sound so bad at first, but this was the notorious Lion of Nemea, a fierce and terrible beast that was rumored to be impossible to kill and ate whole herds of cows and sheep. Eurystheus was pretty sure that his cousin would never make it back. Human-wildlife conflict are problems that happen when growing human populations overlap with established wildlife territory, creating competition for space and resources. Stories about monsters eating livestock are usually a result of this experience. Heracles was all business. He decided to look at every task set before him as a way to make up for the horrible things he had done in Thebes. When he finally found his way to Nemea, he stopped in a small town where he was given shelter by a poor workman. When he heard of Heracles' plan to kill the dreaded Nemean lion, the workman suggested they make an offering to the gods that night to pray for a safe and successful hunt. But Heracles talked him out of it, asking the man to wait 30 days. If I succeed, he said, we will dedicate the lion together in Zeus's name. If I do not, I will be dead and you can dedicate me as a hero. Heracles set out the next day and began tracking the notorious lion. The workman told him stories of arrows and swords bouncing off the hide of the beast. It was said to be invincible. But Heracles was not swayed in the slightest. The lion's paws were so large that the prints were easy to spot, and Heracles tracked the giant cat into the mountains. When he finally encountered the lion, Heracles had to admit it was ferocious looking. It was the biggest cat he'd ever seen, with blood-stained teeth and vicious-looking claws. An adult lion has about 30 teeth. An adult human has between 28 and 32. But the lions are bigger and sharper. Stepping out from behind the rocks, Heracles notched an arrow to his bow and let it fly. A perfect shot to the heart of the beast. Except it didn't stick. The arrow smacked hard against the lion's chest. A strong blow to be sure, but it didn't break the skin. The lion leapt to its feet and charged at Heracles, who was lucky enough to roll away just beyond the reach of the sharp claws. He drew his broadsword and charged, thrusting the blade into the beast with all of his might. But even that couldn't penetrate the hide of the lion. Heracles staggered back, and the lion ran up the hill behind him. He was escaping to higher ground, and Heracles knew he couldn't let that happen. He sprinted as fast as he could after the creature, up a winding path, over an outcropping of rocks, and into a cave. Heracles started in after the lion for a second, but then he stopped himself. Standing at the entrance, he could feel a breeze coming from inside. This meant there was another way in somewhere. So Heracles quickly blocked the mouth of the cave with rocks and boulders, and then raced around to the other side of the mount, where there was, in fact, a second entrance. Now, the lion had no way out. Heracles had him trapped. Before he ventured into the darkness of the cave, Heracles threw down his bow and his sword and his knife, knowing they would be useless. He grabbed his club and marched in to find the lion. It wasn't long before they found each other. The lion was waiting and pounced on Heracles, biting and scratching at the warrior. Heracles swung his club, beating the monster back, and then he pounced on the lion. The great beast thrashed and writhed and roared, but he could not escape Heracles' arms around his neck. Using only his bare hands and his strength, the mighty Heracles finally subdued the Nemean lion without ever piercing his head. Heracles tried several times to skin the lion, but none of his weapons could even make a dent. So he carried the Nemean lion back to the home of his friend the workman, where they had a feast and dedicated the lion in honor of Zeus. I feel it is important to mention here, listeners, that you should not go out and wrestle lions. The lion population in Africa has decreased by 90% in the last century. 
and they are extinct in 26 African countries. We need to help lions, not wrestle them. Also, you'd probably lose. You would definitely lose. Amazingly, the very next morning, Heracles found that he was suddenly able to skin the lion, and he brought the pelt back to Eurystheus as requested. Maybe a little help from the gods? The king was amazed. Heracles had done the impossible. Suddenly, Eurystheus wasn't just jealous anymore. He was actually kind of afraid. He didn't even allow Heracles into the palace to present his prize. In fact, Eurystheus never spoke directly to Heracles after that. He simply sent his commands to the warrior through a messenger and never met him face to face again. Meanwhile, up in Olympus, Zeus was back to bragging about his son, the hero, and Hera was beside herself. She decided to get a little more involved in things as she whipped up a new monster for Heracles to face that was going to be a lot more of a challenge than a big cat with a tough skin. Enter the dreaded Hydra. A six-headed water snake that had suddenly just appeared in an ancient lake near the town of Lerna, terrorizing all of the townspeople nearby. Or at least anybody who wanted to go swimming. Now, the Hydra was a complicated beast. In addition to being a giant water snake with six heads, it could spit acid from any of its mouths, and its blood was poisonous. So, yeah, there was a lot going on there. Heracles knew this was going to be difficult. Fortunately, his nephew Eolaus, the son of his half-brother Iphicles, volunteered to help him. Heracles wasn't really in touch with many folks from his life in Thebes, for obvious reasons, but Eolaus had always been fond of his uncle, and he had journeyed to Tyrans and sought him out so he could help the hero with his quests. Finally, Heracles relented and allowed Eolaus to tag along. The kid wouldn't necessarily fight, but he could help. Something between a servant and a sidekick. You know, this is a long episode of Greeking Out, so I think this is a good spot to pause for a second if you want to get a snack or do some homework, take a stretch before we head into the next labor. Everybody good? You got, we good? We good? You got a snack? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's go. As they approached the lake near Lerna, the Hydra slithered out of the water's edge and roared at Heracles with all six of its heads. Without fear, Heracles charged the giant beast and swung his sword, cutting off one of its heads. Eolaus cheered, and Heracles allowed himself to smile for a second. But only for a second, because he saw that something was growing from the neck that had been severed. Two somethings, actually. The Hydra regrew two heads from the very spot where Heracles had cut away one. Suddenly, Heracles wasn't sure what to do. He ducked and dodged when the monster spit acid at him, grateful for his new Nemean lion skin cloak. And he lunged at the Hydra with his sword and his spear, but it was almost impossible not to cut off a head now and then. I mean, (laughs) these things were snakes. They're pretty much all neck. That's not entirely true. Structurally, snakes do have a specific neck area, a defined tail area, and a backbone of sorts. Most of their vertebrae are thoracic. So that means most of the average snake is an extended chest with a little neck at the top and a small tail at the bottom. Okay, well, thanks, Oracle. Uh, You know how much I love snakes. Yes, I do. I want one. I'm sorry, what? As a pet. I will name her Brenda. Uh, can we talk about this later? Fine. Okay, so, uh, where were we? Snakes. Before that. Heracles was losing to the Hydra. Right. Heracles was exhausted. He was running and dodging and getting nowhere. He had to find a way to stop these heads from growing back. But then, Eolaus got an idea. He lit a torch and waited. Each time Heracles severed one of the Hydra's heads, Eolaus would seal the wound by touching it with flame. This kept the new heads from growing back. And soon, Heracles was able to slay the beast, cutting off the last head and burying it beneath a giant rock. It is said that Heracles also dipped his arrows in the Hydra's poisonous blood to make him extra dangerous with a bow. Indeed. Just a pro tip for any monster fighters out there. (laughs) Well, you never know. (laughs) Thanks. For his third task, Heracles was sent to Caranea to catch a deer. But this wasn't just a deer. It was an enchanted hind, or mother deer, that was dedicated to the goddess Artemis. 
It was larger than a bull and lightning fast. Heracles chased it all over the place, even following it to the northernmost edges of the earth. But eventually, he caught the hind and returned victorious. After that, for his fourth task, he was sent into the mountains to chase down a wild boar. This was another oversized beast that was terrorizing the locals and destroying farms. Giant wild boars appear in several places in Greek mythology. In season two of Greeking Out, you may remember that the warrior Atalanta defeats one as well. Right. So Heracles chased the beast down, but was unable to trap it until he got the idea to drive it into the snow. This made it hard for the boar to run, and once he was slowed down, he was easy prey for Heracles and his boat. When Heracles received the orders for labor number five from Eurystheus, he thought at first there must be a mistake. He even asked the messenger if he had brought the right message, because there were no monsters to fight or beasts to hunt. Instead, the instructions read, travel to Elis and clean the stables of King Augeas in one day's time. <laughs> clean the stables? Was he a warrior or a stable boy? Obviously, this was a task designed to embarrass and humiliate the mighty Heracles, but he didn't realize how bad it would be until he arrived in Elis. It turned out that King Augeas owned more livestock than anyone in Greece. The king was very, very rich, and he had many herds of cows and horses and bulls and sheep and goats, thousands of animals. And every night, an army of shepherds and farmhands would bring them into these stables. So Heracles knew he'd be up to his knees in dung, but this was overwhelming. To put it simply, it was an enormous amount of poop. Even the son of Zeus himself couldn't clean all that up in one day. Although Heracles was pretty sure the gods could smell the stench all the way up on Olympus. But again, Eolaus had an idea. He and Heracles were standing on the bank of a nearby river when it occurred to the young man that maybe the river could help. Heracles smashed through a wall on one side of the stables and then punched another massive hole through the wall on the other side. Then he and Eolaus began to dig. They made a giant trench running from the river to the hole in the side of the stable. Then they dug a second trench that ran from the second hole back to the river. This way, they were able to channel the water from the river into the cattle yard and used it to flush all of this mess out of the stables. In ancient times, aqueducts were a way to move water from one place to another. These were usually channels in the ground or clay pipes. While the Romans are known for their sophisticated aqueduct systems, the Greeks were actually using them as early as the second millennium. Heracles returned to Tyrans proud and victorious and probably pretty smelly. Okay, it was no Hydra fight, but Heracles was proud of the way they managed to handle that task. He was now halfway through his 10 labors. But then, King Eurystheus changed the game. He was certainly happy about the stables being cleaned up a bit, but he wasn't pleased with the success that Heracles was enjoying at all. And he accused the hero of cheating, since two of the labors weren't completed by Heracles alone. Eolaus had helped Heracles defeat the Hydra and clean the stables at Elis, so Eurystheus decreed that Heracles would need to perform two more heroic deeds before his service was complete. And so, the ten labors of Heracles now became twelve, and Heracles knew he had a lot more challenges ahead. And we'll get to all of those challenges the next time we Greek out. Greeking out! That's it for this week, but get ready for our return to the story of Heracles and his 10 or 12 labors next week. National Geographic Kids Greeking Out is written by Kenny Curtis and Jillian Hughes and hosted by Kenny Curtis with Tori Kerr as the Oracle of Wi-Fi. Audio production and sound design by Scotty Beam and our theme song was composed by Perry Grip. Dr. Diane Klein is our subject matter expert, and Emily Everhart is our producer. The stories featured in Greeking Out are original adaptations of classic.